Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ lives. Well, we're following up on our Resurrection Day message where we have been looking at events and people uh, at the end of Jesus' life. And last week, we looked at three of his close followers whose lives were dramatically changed by the resurrected Christ. When Jesus conquered the grave and made it possible for us to have forgiveness of sins and eternal life, he also provided it that we could have a whole new life. And uh, these three that we looked at last week had their lives changed, and we're going to look at some more lives that were changed by the resurrection of Christ today. Well, just to review for a moment, uh, last week we looked and saw that Christ died and rose to give new life to those who have dark pasts. And we used as an example Mary Magdalene, who was uh, controlled by seven demons, and those who have failed. And we used the Apostle Peter as an example, who denied the Lord Jesus, and those who are fearful and uncertain. And we looked at the 10 disciples, Thomas wasn't there and Judas was dead, uh, who were frightened and confused. And what we did is we made, we made an application to our lives. Uh, in other words, if we have dark pasts or we have failed or we have been fearful and uncertain, Christ can change our lives as well. Well, let's look at some more today. Uh, we're going to look, first of all, at uh, Luke 24, 13 through 32. And I'm going to hope that most of you are familiar, at least to some degree, with this, because um, we don't have time to read the whole passage. But this is Jesus' appearance to um, Cleopas and one other follower of Jesus who might have been Cleopas' wife, Mary, but we're not sure. So here are the events. This took place late late on Sunday afternoon, Resurrection Day afternoon, late in the afternoon, in the village of Emmaus. And Cleopas and this other disciple, a follower, were walking along the road, and they were sad, and they were confused, and they were meditating on the things they had experienced. They still were hopeful, because there had been some talk that Christ had risen from the dead. They were seeking to believe, and they were discussing the horrible events of Jesus' um, trial, his mock trial, his torture, his beatings, his crucifixion, his burial. They were discussing these horrible events uh, that had happened in the previous days, and all of a sudden, the risen Christ, the Lord Jesus, comes up and he joins them, and starts walking with them. Now, they did not recognize him, and we don't know for sure why he wasn't recognized, the same way Mary Magdalene, you remember, uh, at the tomb, she didn't recognize him at first, and there's a number of explanations, but no one knows for sure. One is that, of course, Jesus was now in his glorified body. It was a real body. He even ate in a couple instances, um, but his appearance may have been significantly different in some way because he was in his resurrected body, or perhaps in Mary Magdalene's case, between the darkness and the, um, the destruction that had happened to Jesus' face, maybe she didn't recognize him. Uh, but the Bible says here in Luke 24, it doesn't elaborate on how he did it, but it says that God didn't allow them to recognize that it was Jesus. So as the story goes on, you'll probably see why the Lord would do that. But in this case, they didn't recognize him. It was some kind of, it was God's plan that he didn't be, uh, that they didn't recognize him at first. Uh, but we don't really know why, and we don't know how he blocked their recognition. But at any rate, um, so Jesus joins them, and he starts walking along with them, and their, their response is, and you can read this again in Luke 24, 13 to 32, their response is, well, uh, you know, you don't know anything about what's happened the last three days? I mean, it's the talk of the town. Everybody's talking about it, even faraway places of what happened here, and you don't know anything about it? And Jesus, Jesus just lays low, stays under the radar, and says, well, what are you talking about? And they go on to say, well, you know, it's Jesus of Nazareth. We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was going to liberate us from Rome. And 
Uh, now he's been crucified and some of our uh, colleagues went to anoint his body this morning and they couldn't find it and they're all distraught and confused and fearful. And Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus then began to teach them from the scriptures. Now, what scriptures did he have or what scriptures were they familiar with but the Old Testament? They only had the Old Testament. Obviously, the New Testament wasn't written. It wasn't even begun to be, be written. But Jesus used the Old Testament scriptures, and the Bible says that he showed them how even from all way back to Genesis that the Old Testament scriptures spoke of him. They spoke of Jesus, and he let them see how way back when the Old Testament scriptures were all pointing ahead to Jesus and were prophesying about Jesus. And they were, they were, their hearts were excited about what they were being taught, but they still didn't know it was Jesus. And when they came to their destination, Jesus acted like he was going to go on and they persuaded him to stay, and they sat down at the table, and Jesus, uh, as they were going to have a meal, and Jesus took the bread on the table, and he broke it. And when he broke the bread, the scales fell from their eyes, and God the Father now allowed them to recognize Jesus, and they knew it was Jesus, and they were so excited. They have now seen the risen Christ, and they're so excited about it. And they eventually go and run and tell everybody about it, that they saw Jesus and how they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. And so God did remove those scales and let them see it. So the emphasis on this particular uh, 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 event is revelation. It's revelation. Jesus revealed himself. Now, who did he reveal himself to? But to those who were seeking Cleopas and his companion were seeking Jesus. They were meditating on Jesus. They were thirsting for the knowledge of the Lord. They wanted some answers. And when Jesus began to teach them, even though he didn't know, they didn't know who he was, their hearts were burning. Their hearts were excited. So they were people who wanted to know. They were people who were looking for the truth and seeking for the true knowledge of God. And that's something that we don't see much of today. And it's one of the reasons that uh, we're in the situation we're in. Because people are not seeking God. People are not wanting to hear the truth about God. Many people don't even believe there's absolute truth anymore. But by the way, that doesn't change it. Just because you don't believe in something doesn't change its reality. There is absolute truth. There is God. There is Jesus. There is the risen Christ. And just because some people don't want to believe it doesn't change a thing. It's still there. And they're going to be accountable for not accepting what happened. But here... Uh, the, these uh, Cleopas and his companion were thirsting for knowledge of God. They wanted to know the truth. They wanted some answers. They wanted to know and they were seeking God. And you see, that's an example to us, isn't it? It's a great example to us today. And as I was mentioning to our society at large, because if we, the Bible says uh, in, in Matthew in part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and you've heard this where it says, uh, seek and you shall find, ask and, uh, and so on. Um, seek and you shall find, ask and it will be given to you. And, and, and these people were seeking. These people were, uh, that verse talks out with knock, knock, and it will be opened up to you. This part of that verse as well. So these people were knocking at the door wanting to hear truth. They were seeking and they were wanting answers and they were asking. And it's an example to us today. If we will seek and we will find and we will, uh, we will knock and it will be opened up unto us. Seek, ask, knock. And God will reveal himself to you. And that's what people need to do today. So if, if you're in that category where you haven't been seeking the Lord and you haven't been asking and you haven't been knocking, uh, at the door uh, uh, to know the truth, then please do because it's the most important thing in life. Coming to Jesus Christ as your personal Savior is the most important decision that you'll ever make in your life. 
And so um, these people wanted to know, and that's an example to us. They experienced the truth of the risen Lord, and he revealed himself in a real and very, very powerful way. Um, if we truly seek him, we will find. Seek and you will find. Ask it will be given to you. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. What an example to us. And what excitement that Cleopas and his companions saw the risen Christ and it changed their lives. So what we see here is that Christ died and rose to give new life to those who seek. Christ died and rose to give new life to those who seek. And he will give you new life on this earth and he will give you forgiveness of sin and eternal life forever and ever. If you acknowledge Christ as your savior, ask him to come in to forgive you and take over your life and he will do that. Well, let's move on then. Uh, last time we talked about uh, the appearance to the 10 disciples. Remember that? And um, we used it as an example of how Christ can change lives that are f fearful and confused and uncertain. But remember the story that was only 10 disciples. Judas is dead by this point, and Thomas, for some reason, which we don't know, was not there. And so Jesus appeared to the 10 disciples. They got to see him, but Thomas didn't. So they went and told Thomas, and Thomas, uh, this is where he got that unfortunate moniker of uh, doubting Thomas. Uh, Thomas says, hey, I don't care what you guys say, unless I see him, unless I put my fingers in his, his wounds, you know, no way, I'm not gonna believe. And so that's how Thomas was doing. So now what we wanna do, that was a review of that part of last week, and I only reviewed because it ties in now, because now we're gonna look at to the appearance of the risen Christ to Thomas, and to the 10 other disciples. Uh, they, they will be uh, seeing Jesus again, but this time Thomas is gonna be with them. And we see this in John 26 to 31. Let me just read this for you. John, um, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not 26, John chapter 20. Um, we're gonna look at uh, verses 26 to 31. John 20, 26 to 31. And here's what it says. It says a week later, now this is a week since Thomas made that statement when he wasn't there. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them this time. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Remember, he just comes right through locked doors. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so Thomas now sees this uh, he sees Jesus himself, and Thomas believed. Um, the others had told him, but he wouldn't believe. But now Jesus came. Thomas is still vehemently doubting, but guess what? Jesus confronts him and tells him, and he invites him to put his finger in his wounds and to put his hand in Jesus' side, where, remember, it was, it was pierced by the spear. Uh, they wanted to make sure he was dead, and blood and water came forth which indicated that uh, the water came from Jesus' pericardium, the sac around the heart that is for cooling, that proved that he was dead. Um, and so Jesus said, hey, put, put your hand, put your fist in my side where that spear was. And uh, the Bible doesn't tell us whether Thomas took Jesus up on the invitation or not, but we know that Thomas believed because he said, my Lord and my God, and he, he believed. And I want you to know, I, I, uh, I have always been upset that people uh, refer to Thomas as Doubting Thomas. It, it's one of those, those nicknames that un, is unfortunate and people get stuck with it. And the, the truth of the matter is, is that, yeah, Tom, Thomas had doubts, but guess what? I've had doubts, you've had doubts, Peter had doubts, everybody's had doubts, we're all human. 
And Thomas, the fact of the matter is, Thomas not only became a great disciple and, and went out and preached the gospel all over the area and the surrounding towns and countries, Thomas became a mighty, mighty apostle. And get this, Thomas died for his faith. Thomas was a martyr. Not only was he not a doubter, but now he belonged, he believed so strongly. He believed so strongly that he gave his life for his beliefs. He was martyred, and that's a historical fact. So we see that Thomas not being not should be called, he shouldn't be called doubting Thomas because he was believing Thomas to the point of giving his life for his beliefs. And so the emphasis here is reinforcement, reinforcement. The emphasis is for those who doubt, for those who have weak faith, for those who require proof, for those who question, here comes reinforcement, here comes support, here comes strength, here comes conviction from the resurrected Christ. And so for those people, maybe even some watching or listening today, those people who have doubts or have weak faith or they require proof, or if you feel like you're realistic and logical but you lack faith, pray, pray and say to the Lord, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's what was prayed by the gentleman in Mark chapter 9 and verse 24 about the healing of his son. And so uh, those of you who may doubt, including me, just be encouraged. There's reinforcement by the living Christ, by the risen Christ. He'll give us the support that we need. So what's the example to us? The example to us is strength from witness, strength from weakness. We, there's an example here that when we believe in the Lord, there's strength from our weakness. And so when you feel weak, then he can give you the strength. When you feel doubting or frail, he can give you the reinforcement, the support and the strength. When we are weak, Paul says, then we are strong when we trust in Christ. So Thomas proved that even those who have weak faith, those who doubt, those who question sometimes, can become great servants of Christ if they let the risen Christ grip their hearts, which Thomas did in that face-to-face -face thing. What did he say? My Lord and my God. You see? And so... If you let Christ grip your heart, you can overcome doubts. You can overcome weakness. You can overcome uh, questioning. You can overcome that unbelief if you let the risen Christ grip your heart, and he will do that. Thomas finished strong. And you and I need to finish strong, whatever age you are. Now, when you get up in my bracket, you're conscious of the finish line. And so I want to finish strong. And I hope you do, too, even if you're 18 years old or 16 years old. I hope you all want to finish strong. And that's what Thomas did. He finished strong. And now here's an interesting thing. Thomas, as I told you a moment ago, Thomas died for Christ when he couldn't see him. Did you get that? This is the same guy that said, unless I see him and put my finger in his wounds, I'm not going to believe. Now we see him giving his life when he couldn't possibly see Jesus. Jesus was up in heaven when Thomas was martyred. And so Thomas believed when he couldn't see him, whereas before he said, I'm not going to believe until I can see him. You see what I'm saying? God miraculously changed Thomas's life. Um, and it was because Thomas saw the risen Christ. That's what makes the difference in a life is when we see the living Christ. So if Thomas could die for Christ without the assurance of seeing him, how could you and I not live for Thomas? 
or live for Jesus? How could we not live for the Lord? How could we not live for him? Thomas died for him. Can't we live for him? That's what we need to do. So Christ died and rose to give new life to those who have doubted, to those who have doubted. So if you're one of them, the news is good. You embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, you take him as your savior, and you will have that faith and that reinforcement and you won't doubt. Well, let's finish up now with the appearance to James, and this is an interesting one as well. Uh, this is recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. We're not given any details whatsoever. It just says that Jesus appeared to James. So it was an individual special appearance to James. Well, who was James? Well, J James was Jesus' half-brother. He was Jesus' half-brother. And the reason he was his half-brother is because they had the same mother, Mary, you see, Mary was a virgin when Jesus was born. It was her firstborn. She was a virgin. Jesus was born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. But Mary and Joseph had other children. They had at least um, four other sons, and they had at least two daughters. And so one of those other sons was James. So he was the half-brother of Jesus because they had the same mother, Mary. But remember, Jesus didn't have a biological earthly um, father because he was divinely conceived of the Holy, Sp uh, the Holy Spirit. So he didn't have uh, a biological father. So they were really only half brothers. James was Jesus' half brother. Um, he, J Mary was his mother. But listen to this. They, even though they were half brothers technically, they grew up in the same house. They sat at the same table. They played in the same yard. They went to the same places. They probably both worked in their father's carpenter shop. And they were together for nearly 30 years sharing each other's daily life. But James didn't believe. James didn't believe that his brother was the son of God. He didn't believe that his brother was the savior. And we're not sure why not. It might be because he was a devout Hebrew and he was looking for uh, the deliverance of the Jews politically. That's a possibility. We don't know. Uh, it could be that he was just uh, jealous of his brother's perfection. Remember, Jesus never sinned in thought or word or deed. Jesus never had a sinful thought. He never said a sinful word. He never had a sinful deed. So can you imagine growing up next to somebody like that? Mm. <laughs> so, you know, you can imagine there was probably some, some uh, resentment and some jealousy and maybe, maybe even as far as hatred because this guy's perfect that you're growing up with and playing with in the backyard. So um, we don't know. The, I'm just giving you possibilities, and I always have to be careful to tell you what's biblical and what's not. It doesn't say in the Bible why James didn't believe, but it made it clear that he didn't. So even despite that unbelief, we read here in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, that Jesus lovingly made a special, private, post-resurrection appearance to James. Jesus sought him out. Again, we're not given any details. We don't know where, when, what was said, how it was done, nothing. But we know that Jesus went out of his way and made a one-on-one -on -one special appearance to James. You remember last week we were talking about that one-on-one -on -one special um, uh, appearance to Peter because Peter needed to be healed after his denial. Well, here Jesus gives James a one-on-one, -on -one, even though he didn't believe. Uh, after he's resurrected, he goes to James and reveals himself to him one-on-one -on -one because uh, this was his half-brother. And uh, so Jesus graciously did that. And so now I want you to see again, I'm trying to emphasize to us that when the resurrected Christ comes into your life, he changes your life, when you realize that Jesus lives, when you realize that 
after that terrible crucifixion, he rose from the dead victoriously, then you, you, you have this excitement and you have this reality. And guess what? Your life is going to be changed when you see Jesus. And I want you to know how James's life was changed. James was a skeptic, didn't even believe in his own brother's work. And he turned out to be not only a mighty believer, not only a strong apostle that was spreading the good news, but he became one of the leaders, the top leader of the Jerusalem church. He was a great pillar of the church. So once James saw Jesus, resurrected Jesus, this skeptic became a strong apostle and a, a pillar of the church. What changed him? Seeing the risen Christ. Why did he change? Because he saw Jesus. And that's what I'm trying to get you to see today, that if you embrace Christ, your life will be changed. Well, what's the emphasis here? The emphasis is reality. It's to those, it's reality to those who grew up with Jesus. Now, when I make this application to us today, um, we didn't literally grow up with Jesus, but some of you watching and some of you listening grew up with Jesus in the sense that you heard about him in church. Um, you may have gone to Sunday school. You learned about him. You may have gone to church camp. Um, you knew about Jesus. You grew up with Jesus, the idea of Jesus, so to speak, but you never really believed. You never really made a commitment. And that's what I'm asking you to do today. If you grew up with Jesus, but never really believed, never really committed your life to him, never really asked him to come into your heart and forgive your sin and to give you eternal life, then you need to do that. And so this, this is for people who grew up with Jesus, but never made that, com that commitment. So the example to us is, is that we need to submit to being changed by the Lord and commit our lives to him. You've grown up with Jesus. You've got all this stuff up here in your head. I'm asking you to move it 18 inches from your head to your heart. Move it from your head to your heart. And why am I asking you to do that? Because Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. He conquered the, the, the grave. He conquered death. He conquered Satan. And so you can go from just believing in your head to believing in your heart for growing up with Jesus to committing your life to Jesus. Let the resurrection change your life. Let him empower you to become a mighty servant of Christ, just as James did. Let others see the reality of Christ in you so they'll be drawn to him. Because remember, Christ died and rose to give new life to those who have grown up with Jesus and perhaps know a lot about him, but have never truly believed and committed their lives. Do it today. God bless you.